please give a warm welcome to Brett Kuntz. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank Google for having me. Uh, today we're going to talk about convolutional neural networks with Swift and a little bit of Python. Very broadly, my goal is to go from about as basic a level of this subject, uh, convolutional ne networks for image recognition, to arrive at the current state of the art in this field. Uh, towards this end, we'll sort of do a quick overview of neural networks in general, and we'll look at a 1D version of the MNIST uh, demo data set. From there, we'll introduce convolutions, and we'll tackle the MNIST problem again using a 2D approach. From there, we'll look at how we can stack some convolutions together, and we can tackle a slightly larger problem called CIFAR. From there, we'll look at how we can continue to build up these blocks of convolutions in order to produce VGG, which was a state of art approach in 2014. From there, then, we'll look at how we can modify ResNet slightly to produce uh, ResNet, and then uh, from there, we'll have a very solid, modern, state-of-the-art approach. Then we'll do a quick demo of building and training that on a TPU. After that, we'll look at a very recent paper in this field, which is called EfficientNet, and then we'll do a demo of running EfficientNet on an Edge TPU device. So here we go. Uh, computer vision is a very large field, we'll say. Uh, four well-known areas are here. Uh, to put them in the canonical cat and dog, uh, example set, uh, we have image recognition, or is this a cat or dog picture? Object detection, or where is the cat in this picture? Image segmentation, or which pixels are cat pixels? And then finally, instance segmentation, how many sets of cat pixels do we have in this picture? Neural networks were kind of a curiosity for many years. A lot of traditional machine learning is centered around reducing problems to 1D or trying to reduce the search space. Neural networks kind of go the opposite direction. They basically learn an activation function, and their power is that they can learn any activation function. As a result, they're really good at separating high-dimensional data. Images, although we don't think of them this way, to a computer are a five-dimensional problem. You have three different color channels and then a height and width channel and then you're mapping it to some sort of category at the end. In order to solve these sort of problems, uh, we use a technique called backpropagation, and then we often end up having to chain large quantities of functions together. So A applied to B, B applied to C, C, D, E, and so on and so forth. In order to do this, we use a much beloved rule from calculus called the chain rule. Everybody hates the chain rule. And so somebody said, well, heck, why don't we have the computer keep track of all this? So auto differentiation is not really a new idea in this field. It actually comes from the 1970s or so. What's, what's new and interesting, what we're doing now today, is we're combining this auto differentiation with the compiler itself in order to make it much more easier for the computer to reason about what's happening. So Swift, the language, I would argue, isn't in itself particularly special. It's been out for a little while. Many iOS programmers have adopted it, and it's brought some functional programming language concepts to the older C crowd. But the real power of Swift, I would argue, is that it's closely tied to the Clang compiler, and so it can very easily reach in and assess the capabilities of Clang. So here at the bottom, we have sort of uh, the basic building blocks of neural networks. We have the perceptron, this is actually from 1958. Neural networks are far older than you might think. Uh, we have feed-forward networks, which were the first major uh, single-layer improvements. And then what we're going to do next is build a deep feed-forward neural network, very simply quite identical to this one. And then we're going to add some convolutions in order to produce a deep convolutional neural network on top. So MNIST is a well-known data set in this field. It's a collection of hand-drawn images converted to grayscale. Uh, the images are 28 pixels across by 28 pixels down. But we're not even going to treat it as an image, we'll say. So what we're going to literally do is take each row of the MNIST data set and convert it into an extremely long vector. So that's what this second picture over here is trying to demonstrate. Then we're literally going to take this vector, 
which is 20 by 28 by 28 or 784 rows long, and run it through two 512 densely connected neural network layers. And then finally, at the end, we're going to map it to 10 different categories, the numbers 0 through 9. <laughs> so uh, I originally set out to write this code for you all, uh, but this gentleman named Juan, another GDE, had a very beautiful example of this all together, so I simply modified his demo slightly. Um, so here's a 45-line uh, demo of how to solve the MNIST data set uh, using uh, Swift for TensorFlow. Um, this is all of his code. And uh, what we have right here is just our very simple neural network. We have our input layer of 784, two 512 layers, and then our output. And because we used all this within Swift things, we can then run everything through to produce our final result. So let's run this very simply. OK. So we've made a simple neural network that's able to have 93% accuracy on the MNIST data set. Um, uh, to be honest, we're kind of cheating. We're using larger, denser layers than you would normally use, uh, but we'll come back to that here in a second. Next, let's introduce convolutions. I would love to throw a single slide up here and explain to you convolutions very simply, uh, but it's a pretty complicated subject. Um, I stole this slide from an NVIDIA deck from a year or two ago, but they're simply explaining how you can use convolutions to produce a blur. So we have our input image, and then we have over here our blurred output image. Our convolution is just all ones, and so each, source, each result pixel is simply the sum of the pixels in the original image. So we do it once here, we step over a, pixel, a row of pixels, do it again, and repeat this process over and over and again until we have a, blurred, a full result input output image. If we, you don't really need to understand the blurring part per se, but you really need to understand this striding concept. The next convolution we need to add is max pool. This is very simple to understand, I think. We have a collection of 16 pixels. We want to produce four pixels out. And we just look in each collection of pixels and take the largest one out. So let's revisit MNIST again, but this time we'll use a proper uh, 2D convolutional approach to solve our problem. Uh, we're going to take our input, which is now just 28 by 28, same input, run it through two layers of 3 by 3 convolutions, a max pool, and then we keep our tame to densely connected 512 layers and our final output. So this code looks like this. I've literally changed nothing from the last demo. This is all the same. We've simply added these two convolutions and this max pull operation. And then finally, uh, we are processing this layer before the first, second one. Um, this one will take about a minute to run, and it'll end up at 96% accuracy. Uh, but I can assure you it runs. So we've cut our error in half by introducing convolutions, but not changing anything else. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, we've worked with black and white data so far, so now let's take on color. Uh, we'll look at the CIFAR data set, which is slightly larger, 32 pixels by 32 pixels, but now we have three channels, red, green, blue data. But our same basic approach that we've used before can be used here as well. So we have our 32 by 32 by now three, our same two layers of convolutions and a max pool, another two layers of convolutions and a max pool, our same two densely connected layers, and finally our output layer. Uh, for this demo, I modified one of the demos in the Swift Models repository. Uh, but conceptually, um, it's more or less identical to the two tricks we've looked at before. Uh, we'll run this. It'll take a while to run. And we'll end up somewhere around 60% accuracy, or sorry, 70% accuracy, which isn't great for CIFAR, 
but we've shown how we can simply uh, tackle a larger problem by adding these blocks. So we might take this concept and sort of parameterize things. We might say, okay, we have two layers of convolutions, two more, you know, if we could somehow convert this into a function. We might even then say, well, why not have two layers? Why not have three or even four? So if we took this idea and jumped into DeLorean and went back in time five years, <laughs> we'd be able to uh, possess the state-of-the-art image recognition network in the world. Uh, this is VGG16, which uh, won the ImageNet competition that year, but it's nothing more complicated than the tricks we've looked at so far. Uh, we have two, uh, sorry, our, now we're working with the ImageNet data set. So we have about a million pictures, a thousand different categories, and our images are now a little bit larger, so we've gone to 224, 224 pixels by 224 pixels, but everything else remains roughly the same. Two layers of convolutions, a max pool, two layers of convolutions, max pool, three layers of convolutions, max pool, three, three. Uh, our dense layers for this one are a little bit wider, so we go from 512 to 4096, and then finally for our output layer, we use a thousand categories. So where do we go from there? Uh, residual networks are the next important concept to understand. What we have over here on the far left, or sorry, on the left side of these graphs is VGG19, which is the cousin of the VGG16 we were just looking at. The only difference is this is 22444, and then out to the end. So what we have next to it is the backbone of the ResNet 34 network, which is conceptually more or less identical to what we've looked at before. We have an input layer, Three, three layers of two by two blocks, four layers of two by two blocks, sorry, four th layers of two three by three blocks together, six paired layers of two by two blocks, and then finally three more at the end. Um, the final crucial trick that ResNet introduces is that now we have this concept of this residual layer, which goes down the far side. Basically, we connect each layer of these blocks together with an extra, we'll say, sort of shortcut path. Conceptually, neural networks are really lazy, and so if they can get the answer at a higher place in the stack of blocks, they'll sort of shortcut it to the end. As a result, whereas VGG, we can technically make it larger, we're starting to hit the limits of how much noise will be introduced in the function, whereas residual networks can be scaled up much larger to solve bigger and better problems. So this network here is ResNet 34, but we need to make one more change in order to produce ResNet 50, which is a very solid modern state-of-the-art approach. So we take our two layers of three by three blocks and replace them this, with this one by one, three by three, one by one convolutional stack at each place. So each pair of blocks gets replaced with this set of three. So now let's train uh, ResNet 50 on the ImageNet data set using a TPU in the cloud. Uh, the first command we need is the CTPU up. I ran this 20 minutes ago. This is basically some shell bookkeeping. And then the rest is all just uh, pretty much standard. Uh, there's some errors because uh, they're throwing a lot of warnings for TF2, uh, but you can ignore that for now. Um, so basically, if we leave this running for about 12 hours, we'll have produced uh, ImageNet 50 or sorry, ResNet 50 trained on the ImageNet data set. Uh, ResNets have kind of proven to be unreasonably effective, we'll say. Uh, although this network's from 2015, uh, many uh, other convolutional neural networks have tried to take its place at the top of the throne, we'll say, so to speak. Uh, but it's kind of like held its status as the strongest network out there. Uh, there's a couple reasons for this, uh, but basically what I would argue is that this one by one, three by three, one by one convolutional block layer is not really more powerful than our three by three layers. The trick of this bottleneck layer, we'll say, is hidden in this last 256 down here. The last layer of this bottleneck increases the number of filters by a factor of four. Um, we could technically do this with the three by three network. The problem is it's really expensive. So conceptually, I would say that this one by three by one convolutional layer is weaker, but it's also cheaper. And because it's cheaper, 
we can do more of it. And because we can do more of it, then it ends up being more powerful. So in order to replace residual networks, what we don't need is something that's technically better. People have built better networks, we'll say, by making them both wider, deeper, and uh, larger. But what we really need is something that's more efficient. Uh, so this paper came out in May of this year, and it's the culmination of several years of research by the Google team. Uh, what they've done, basically, is parameterize all these possible values, and then they've turned the uh, reinforcement learning algorithm loose to search through all the possible search space of these networks. Uh, the end result is this efficient net, which is the new state of the art in this field. Um, I would, you know, like I said, I would argue this is a result of a lot of effort. Uh, the original NASNet paper came out, and the computers sort of produced many weird looking architectures, and people didn't really like, they were just like, oh, you've thrown a bunch of CPU power or TPU power at this problem. Uh, there was the PNAS paper, where they tried to improve the search algorithm slightly. And then the AmoebaNet paper from last year, which also sort of produced sort of uh, convolutional neural network layers that only a computer could love. Um, so what's cool to me about this paper is effectively they've used the computer to sort of find this whole group of networks, but then they've gone in on top and been able to apply mathematical heuristics in order to scale these things up in a reliable, repeatable, reproducible way. So. I think, honestly, only Google could have done this also as well. Um, they're the only one really with the hardware, we'll say the compute capacity, doing the, doing the software, uh, the ability to run these sort of experiments at scale, and then finally they have the research team that's actually actively pursuing these techniques. Um, this came out at the start of last month. Um, we can think of the search space for our convolutional, you know, our, our, our search algorithm as being accuracy, perhaps. Uh, but we can also put different parameters in there. Uh, so one parameter that we could potentially put in there is just the number of operations that we're using to produce our results. So Google is now making these edge TPU devices, which are a small little bitty GPU that you can buy for $75. Uh, they put this architecture into the efficient net uh, search strategy, and it was able to produce this particular set of networks, which are not or are designed or run very fast and whatnot on these edge GPU devices. Um, so if you look at our ResNet 50 from before, you can see this is efficient net. This edge TPUs variant is kind of the holy grail. It's smaller, it's faster, and it's better. So uh, you know I would highly suggest that you uh, check out this stuff. So now uh, let's uh, run a efficient net on an edge TPU device. Uh, so here, uh, all this code's on the internet, but I'll step you through it here. Uh, first, we'll, we'll run this on a TPU3. Um, uh, the only fun trick is that this is all pretty bleeding edge, so you need to have the TensorFlow nightlies enabled. Uh, so I did that 20 minutes ago. This runs fine on a TPU2 as well. Uh, we have some more bookkeeping here like before, we can just copy paste all this and run it. Uh, so now it's all running happily in the cloud. Uh, this will take about 30 hours to complete <laughs> and it'll produce a, a checkpoint for us. Um, next, in order the TPU, edge TPU devices, uh, use int8 math. So uh, what, the, uh, what this network will produce is a floating point version. So we need to modify our network by converting it to int8. Uh, they've, so we, we copy the image file locally. Uh, and then we can just uh, run this quantization script in order to produce our quantized network. Uh, the only fun part of getting this working was that this script relies on the XLA operations in TensorFlow, which aren't part of any of the default builds, so you have to install it from source or build it from scratch. And 
And so then finally, uh, we'll go to Wikipedia and download the panda picture, and we'll run the uh, completely standard uh, ImageNet demo that they have in the Edge TPU demos. Uh, the only other modification I've made is, made is I've provided a list of uh, ImageNet labels for the, to work with. Okay, so our network thinks that it's looking at a panda picture with approximately 60% probability, but it might also be a fox. It's not perfectly sure. Okay, uh, to recap, our goal is to com cover convolutional neural networks for image recognition. Towards that end, we build a one-dimensional neural network and apply it to a very simple data set. From there, we added convolutions and built up a 2D neural network. From there, we added more and more layers to solve larger and larger problems. Then we added residual blocks and looked at how we can modify our block types in order to finally arrive at state of the art approaches in this field. Um, this is about all I have for convolutional neural networks per se. Um, but many of the interesting applications of CNNs are in completely non-image related fields, we'll say. Uh, you can add another layer, begin to deal with depth, Z dimension. Uh, QA Net was an interesting paper where they converted language models into a CNN residual style approach. AstroNet is an interesting use of CNNs to try and find planets. Uh, the recent AlphaFold play, paper, um, and Multicom is another version of a similar idea, but they use 1D and 2D and 3D networks together in order to model protein data. Um, originally, I tried to put up a little piece of each of these slides up here, but this slide got a little bit busy, so I reduced it down. Uh, so what you're looking at right here is one of the residual blocks of alpha zero. Um, the alpha zero engine is 40 of these blocks all together. But if you look at this block, it's literally a residual layer, just like we were looking at before, and then two three by three convolutions. So the same basic approach that we use on the MNIST approach, MNIST data set, can, in a different context, be used to solve the game of Go. So uh, that's all I've got, and I'd like to thank you all for coming.